Thanks everyone for being here. And uh, I'm also, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be part of this organization committee organizing this event with Gordon, uh, Dr. Liu Xuan and uh, others. Uh, it's been a really pleasure. And uh, this is actually, my th I think my third time presenting in this conference, which I feel very honored and very fortunate because this is a really broad community which brings in people from different community, different, um, different uh, research areas and industry, people who brought a lot of great thoughts into this. And uh, I also appreciate Dr. Peter Stone mentioning about the, actually the, the definition of artificial intelligence is actually much broader than what we're currently are looking at. Um, many years ago in 2012, we actually work on research studies focused on how to better represent medical knowledge in large scale medical ontologies and terminologies. And we were able to publish papers in journals like Artificial Intelligence Medicine. And this year, when I taught a course of health informatics in our school, and my student asked me, like, why can you publish that kind of paper in this journal of, of, of artificial intelligence? I was saying, like, knowledge representation and the uh, uh, representation of information in a structure is considered artificial intelligence. It's not like only deep learning or chatbot or language models are considered artificial intelligence, which are actually are pretty common, common, uh, like, um, uh, uh, thoughts of common um, people, but here in this particular uh, occasion, I want to kind of bring about like some of the ideas that we have been investigating in the past few years in terms of how to better promote transparency, equitability, and also uh, explainability of artificial intelligence, especially in advancing medical care and health care. Um, and uh, I want to give you some thoughts about like why do we really care about this uh, issue and uh, where we are right now. And I'm trying to keep, give my talk very high level so that we want to kind of allow everyone to be able to understand. Um, so um, the expenditure of healthcare, as you know, is great. It's, it's very significant. It's pretty much takes about 20 to 25% of the GDP of the country. And the last year, uh, the expenditure of healthcare in 2022 is of roughly $4.5 trillion. If you kind of um, uh, divide it by the population, it's roughly $30,000 per person. But if you look at health expectancy, life expectancy compared to other countries in Europe and Asia, actually, the uh, in terms of life expectancy, the American, um, the which is the the record, is not very good. Um, and if you look at also um, hospitalization due to major diseases like heart failure, the hospitalization rate actually also grows over time. So which makes us concerned. Like we have so many technologies, so much advanced interventions to treat those diseases. Why still we see those um, uh, health outcomes not getting better and better? So we come to like you know the conclusion that there was still has there's still a lot to do in terms of bringing down our cost and improving how health outcomes. And uh, over the years, um, because the healthcare is such an industry where we collect data from all of the places, and there's opportunity to leverage data science and artificial intelligence to improve health. And back in 2015, there was an initiative called Precision Medicine that most focused on providing uh, individualized treatment to patients so that when patients got those treatments, they can get better responses so that they can better um, outcome of the health. And later on, in the re more recent years, um, the concept of precision health has been mostly promoted because you know, we realized that in order to really understand the impact of those factors, we really have to look at multiple information, including your genetic information, your health behavior, environmental factors, and also more recently, we're looking at um, a concept of social determined health, which constitutes about, or which may impact about 40% of health outcomes in, in the population. And especially the precision medicine is more focused on the treatment of a disease when it occur, and prevention health is more focused on how to better prevent those diseases from happening by looking at those factors that may impact health. So in this realm, prevention of diseases, uh, when the disease really happened, how to better manage diseases with most advanced technologies, and also providing better treatment is very important. And here is we look at what kind, of, what kind of opportunities are there, what kind of data are there for us to really move the needle. So here is a, a, a big picture about what kind of health care data we can work with um, in, the, in, the, in the current um, world. And uh, it's, you know, it kind of com comes from all over the places. Like you know, the blue um, um, uh, red uh, squares actually are looking at data that are can, collected, can be collected on point of care. When you go to see a doctor, your data are being collected into electronic health records, and those data are made available for research and modeling, et cetera. And also there's a lot of data that are not captured in a clinical setting, which are things like your genetic information, your, your family history, your social interaction with other people, and also your um, social network um, exposure. 
um, and things like your um, your activities, daily activities, and those things can also somewhat impact health. If we are able to kind of incorporate all of this information into this uh, big data um, realm, we should be able to better provide interventions that better treat patients. And also, um, we've seen also enormous amount of efforts being, being made on the different levels. On the federal level, we've seen efforts such as all of us, researcher workbench, which allows us to really leverage big data technologies to access data collected from genetic and also from EHR, electronic health record, and also behavior data. And also they have provide data from health surveys to allow us to do analytics. And also through COVID-19, we have seen research that we really be enabled by this big resource called National Cohort, National Cohort, COVID Cohort Initiative Collaborative, which actually aggregate data from over 70 healthcare systems and to create this large data, data research network, which includes over data of over 10 million patients. And this kind of efforts will not be available if those data were not previously collected by those different healthcare systems in a more structured way, so they can share those data to, the, to, the, to this uh, consortium. And uh, we're talking about AI-enabled precision health, um, which essentially means that we can capture those information collected from, well, from, clinical, from clinical care setting and also from home setting, from your um, social networks, to be able to provide more deep phenotyping to understand what is actually the molecular structure of your disease so that we can better understand what is the cause of the conditions and then how to better treat them. And then we were able to leverage deep learning and also other type of machine learning technologies to better incorporate those information, encode this information into, um, into, a, into a feature vector and then using those technologies to predict outcome for patients. So some of the outcomes that are very concerning for uh, healthcare systems, including, for example, 30-day readmission is one of the quality measures that helps now, you know, kind of uh, hospital and healthcare systems to better understand how the care are being provided and they want to reduce hospitalization as much as possible and readmission as much as, much as possible. So it's possible to leverage those uh, machine learning and deep learning technologies to uh, predict those so that when you actually are looking at those patients at the first uh, admission, you are able to understand their risk for being readmitted to hospitals in the future so that it can provide more tailored treatment and prevent those things from happening. So the application of data science is enormous, uh, like health outcome prediction, as I mentioned, predicting outcomes, including mortality, uh, including uh, readmissions, including like you know, health uh, condition occurrences in the future. Those are all some of the major health outcomes predictions that are being tackled. And also people are very concerned about drug interactions when you are using particular medication already. And if a doctor prescribes you with another med medication, which could potentially interact with the existing medications, with, uh, which causes adverse events, that is not going to be um, a, a, a good thing, right? So they want to prevent that from happening during the point of care through the clinical decision support systems. And also, as you know, clinical trials are very much important um, gold standard evidence for providing medical evidence to treatment. So, but, you know, typically you can only recruit like 100,000 patients into a trial, which might not be very diverse. So you want, want to leverage um, data science and the deep learning to be able to understand the heterogeneity of the population so that you can recruit those patients from different diverse background and you can test their efficacy as well as safety so that you can reduce the likelihood of having serious adverse events in the population when the drug has been approved by FDA and used by the, by the population. So those kind of things are all very much needed and very important critical health applications that can be enabled by, um, by precision medicine, data science, and machine learning. But here in this particular presentation, I want to more emphasize in the idea of explainable AI um, why this is a really important topic that we're concerned about is because even though we can, we can actually kind of generate or model um, those diseases, health outcomes using deep learning, using ensemble learning, whatever technology you can think of, if you cannot provide a sufficient level of explanation and to your end users, which are clinicians or doctors who are really treating patients, you're not going to be able to let them really buy in your system, be buying your disease support because they cannot com confidently trust the system to provide um, their decision-making um, decisions. So this figure actually uh, give, you, give us some sort of idea about general idea about explainable AI. When you incorporate things like medical evidence and guidelines and as, as well as medical information collected from point of care, you'll be able to incorporate those information into some kind of a model, whatever model it is, to generate some prediction risk model to predict, for example, your risk of a remission. Let's say if your risk is 75%, and then what does that matter, right? Well, how come this particular model can come up with this, with this decision? So the doctor or nurses will be able to want to really learn what's the risk factors that are being there because traditionally 
they are getting used to things like logistic regression, which can produce like coefficient that produce that ranking of features. So in the area of deep learning, they're still expecting you to produce such a kind of feature importance so they can make decision whether this particular um, um, decision is reliable or trustworthy. So, and also from our experiences, like from a machine learning expert experiences, typically we want to make sure that the model is interpretable on a global scale, which means that we want to be able to interpret our model and so to compensate that this model is reliable across the board. But for the clinicians and the physicians, they are probably more concerned about individual cases. For given particular patient's uh, data, can you confidently predict this patient's outcomes and give me the reason why you make such a prediction? So there's actually some, some, some sort of different opinion regarding the use of explainable AI. So if you look at this kind of concept map between different um, um, like concepts in this realm, uh, we're talking about explainability, which actually means that the task model that's supposed to perform some sort of a pr a prediction can be either intrinsically interpreted, uh, interpretable, or can be explained or um, by some post hoc methods that can be um, faithful and can uh, adequately and accurately represent the nature of the model to predict such outcome. And also under explainability, there is a notion of interpretability and fidelity. So interpretability actually means whether the explainable results are actually interpretable by the end users, whether they can be understood by the human who doesn't know anything about deep learning or machine learning, whatever models, and uh, that's comprehensibility. And then the fidelity, as I mentioned, it was how your model, how your post hoc uh, explanation can adequately, accurately describe in the task model. So those are all some of the factors that determine whether the method or your model you, you generate is explainable or not. And then if we look at specific, um, um, specific examples or different categorization of uh, explainable AI methods, uh, back in 2020, we actually conducted the first study in the area of medicine um, published this paper in Journal of American uh, Medical Informatics Association uh, called Explainable Artificial Intelligence Model Using Real-World Electronic Health Worker Data. And this paper, uh, when, when this paper actually was, was, was published and worked, I was um, you know, kind of actually uh, challenging my student, why do we call it explainable AI? And we actually talk about you know, why, why do we should call it explainable AI well, or we should call it like a trustworthy AI. There's even some argument about terminology used at that moment. But we're able to conduct this study and we actually look at over 6,000 papers after a systematic search and scope them down through a systematic approach to 40 some papers and look at their different um, methodology approach and then categorize them using um, uh, this approach. We're, we're concerned about um, whether those methods can be actually used in, in real clinical setting as well at that time. So in terms of um, explainable model, um, we can categorize them into intrinsically interpretable models. If you're familiar with logistic regression, you know that they can generate coefficient for features so we can rank the coefficients to figure out which features are more important when make predictions. And things like decision tree can also be considered as intrinsically interpretable models because you can translate that kind of model into a very easy understandable uh, rules for human to understand what is the um, reason why such a decision made. And then there's getting more and more like the post hoc explanation getting more important because of the popularity of deep learning models, which are very hard to be intrinsically interpretable. So things like Shapley values, which is based on uh, game-based theory. Game theory can provide some sort of a, a black box-based um, uh, prediction uh, on explanation of the models and show you either whether particular, um, uh, interpret, inter, what particular instance can be predicted and what are the causes, and then also the global scale if you aggregate the results. Um, so here are some examples of global interpretation, like given a particular feature space, an explainer will be able to generate decision tree explaining how the decision made. And also for particular instances like this one, you can, you can show what features are important for making prediction of someone having a fluid um, condition. But there's also some argument in, in, in the area in terms of the balance between accuracy and interpretability. And we were arguing whether all the models should be interpretable and whether, especially in the healthcare setting, do we have to make sure that we favor interpretability over accuracy? And the researchers have argued that if the, if the, if the application is low stake, which means that it doesn't do any harm, even though some results may not be adequately trustworthy. You can still reliably use those models that can produce the best performance. But for some high-stake applications, like you know, making decisions for people's particular could cause harm or even you know, lead to serious outcomes, those applications, you should try to make sure that the models are interpretable. So there are some papers published in both community, medical community, as well as informatics communities on that front. So in our lab, we have been doing a lot of research and work in this area. So back in 2020, 2022, my students who are right now a postdoc at Stanford, 
she developed this um, um, like longitudinal interpretation uh, framework where we use Shapley values to try to interpret uh, the 24 hour prediction for mortality. So we use ICO data, only using data for the 24 hours to predict whether the patients were likely to die within seven days of ICU admission. And then we can separate data into six hour time chunk into um, uh, this feature space. And then we use recurrent neural ne network with GRU unit. And then we are using Shapley value to interpret it. So we were able to demonstrate that over time, some lab values um, importance will degrade and some other lab values will increase over time in terms of importance making prediction for this outcome. And on a local scale, we can also demonstrate that some of the interpretation makes sense. Like this one shows the prediction um, interpretation for a part of a person who died in seven days and why the model makes such a prediction based on patients' uh, uh, clinical variables. So even though this is small, I can show, I can say like, we've seen like, you know, things like hemoglobin value getting worse and also things like gradient value getting worse over time to demonstrate that this result is safely and reliable to trust this model to make such a prediction. And also um, this is a result generated by shaft value, uh, which gives you also the um, prediction probability over time. So you can actually observe how likely the model can predict such a case to, to be like that. And there are a lot of challenges in health data science as well in terms of using leverage real world data. Like the data might be potentially biased by its own because the data are collected in the healthcare setting could only pertain to those people who can afford healthcare and who have healthcare insurance. And also the coding information can also be problematic. Over time, may, you may code medical conditions in different ways. So that could potentially influence the model performance over time. And there is also a lot of information that is not missing, that is missing in the clinical structure data, which are embedded in clinical narratives, which warrants the use of natural processing and text mining approach to extract those information. So this paper was published in 2022 later, which leveraged large amount of EHR data to identify different subtypes of, ICE, uh, of COVID-19 um, uh, among the population. They use both the data from New York State City and also Florida uh, to look at what kind of conditions are co-occurring a, a lot for particular subtypes of, of COVID-19 uh, patients. And um, this paper was published in Nature Medicine, which is one of the top journal in, in medicine. But when the paper published, it got a lot of questions from the community. So these are some of the questions raised by community in, in Twitter. And they were asking why some conditions are not occurring together and why some conditions are missing. And this result is not very, very, very reliable. And they're questioning also the, the, the use of deep learning or data mining techniques in terms of identifying some risk or some sub types of COVID-19. So what we've seen, you know, people from both communities actually that are they're, they're actually competing and they're, they're also questioning the value of it. So, so I think there's a lot of issues around this, um, but whole society is moving to the right direction in terms of leveraging data science and, and the digital methods to identify the causes of those diseases. And this paper was published also in 2022. And the researchers used a national uh, a transportation registry work uh, database called the UNOS, look at how can you predict patients' outcome in uh, one year for mortality after you receive any transplantation. And they look at 30-day, um, uh, they look at 90-day transplantation outcome mortality and also one-year mortality. So what, they, what this paper is really interesting is that typically when you do machine learning, you know, like we do cross-validation where you take random sample for training, random sample for testing. But this one, they try to look at whether you, if you take a random sample for training on different time frame, whether that results could influence the prediction accuracy, which actually is a case. They call it rolling cross-validation where they kind of roll this um, a training data over time from 1994 to 2016, and they found that the AURC actually varies over time. And also they see some variables are actually quite diverse over time, indicating that there is actually a very different, um, there, there is a temporal shift in terms of Medicaid uh, prediction for this particular task. So you have to be careful. And also we're lucky to see that uh, on AI community, there are a lot of AI principles being developed and also being proposed to ensure that what we produce and what we report are going to follow those principles in terms of transparency, justice, fairness, equity, and to make sure that we don't do harm. This is especially important for the medical, medical community because we want to always improve outcomes instead of reduce outcomes. Um, and also we've seen um, you know, either uh, professional organizations or, or publishers, they are actually reinforcing some medical AI requirements. When you report those papers, you have to report those different aspects, especially on a patient population, demographic architecture of models and providing some more rigorous model evaluation, both internal validation using the data that you use for training the model, as well as external validation using data that's not used to train the model. So those are all some of the good efforts that we've seen over the time. And now we're actually looking at how researchers are following those guidelines because guidelines are not 
really reinforced in a way that uh, really decide the fact, the, 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 you know, the, the, the results of, of, of publication. And also we've seen some gaps there in terms of how good you are incorporating medical knowledge into those developing uh, in these guidelines. Because in medical uh, science, it's really important that you incorporate medical experts' opinion when you develop the model. For example, what features did you select as risk factors for when you, when you build those AI models, right? You know, if you lose or miss some particular important risk factors, the results may not be adequately understandable or, or even valid. So those are not adequately captured. And uh, from the data collection perspective, there are national initiatives like Bridge to AI and AI Ahead, which actually look at how we can collect data in a fair, equitable, and, uh, and transparent way at the point of data collection. Because oftentimes we've seen data used um, uh, using retrospective data. They're not actually collecting in a way that is equitable, and some populations are not well represented. So that is really being tackled by these national initiatives. And also we've seen a tremendous amount of work in generative AI in healthcare as well. So as you see in this picture, it was, uh, was, was published in Google blog. Um, it shows that with the explosion number of parameters, you actually can generalize those models to apply into different domains. And also we've seen general AI models in medical care, which is very encouraging as well. And this paper published in 2022, later 2022, they're trying to um, in, in kind, of reach, uh, kind of refine this model of um, POM, which is Google model using medical AI, medical QA question answering data set and using different problem strategies to make sure that they can answer some questions in medical, uh, in, in healthcare uh, more confidently and, and adequately. And this is also the first model that can pass the medical licensing exam, which, of, uh, which have a very um, difficult questions. So for example, in this question, they're asking for this patient with this particular condition and this particular disease and, uh, and the symptoms, what medication were used to treat this patient. And this model will not only be able to choose the correct answer, but also providing the reason and rationale behind choosing a particular answer among all the options. And also this example shows that physician, when the physician answer questions, if they're not actually being more elaborative compared to those medical AI generative models, but still like, you know, whatever models generating those answers should be concerned because they're not using the data that are used for training those doctors. So the answer could be different and we're not sure why they're, they're so reliable or not. So they actually, this paper is 40 pages long, very extensive, and they actually did a lot of evaluation to evaluate the answers generated by those models, both using multiple choice questions and also as free text questions like this one. In terms of future direction, I think we are very much interested in developing models to promote the area of experimental AI, especially medicine, and to improve uh, transparency, trustworthiness. And my research team actually is looking at different, different ways on a technology per, uh, front, what type of models can be more trustworthy and can be more transparent, explainable, and also from a social technical approach, how to look at patients' responses and the, and the physicians' responses to those models. When they see those models, do they really trust those models or not? And also on the applied AI research front, um, we need to look at how good we can trust, uh, how, how good those generative AI models is in terms of providing patients and the providers some responses to medical questions, because we think there's opportunity to leverage those models to provide better patient education that when patients actually see the doctor, they can be better prepared to answer meaningful questions to their, to their providers. So my research lab is called eHealth Lab. We look at uh, different um, problems like artificial intelligence for aging, clinical research informatics, explainable AI medicine, and also consumer health informatics. So we've been funded by NIH grant over the past few years, and we're still being funded by three, R three NIH grants. Uh, so it's a well-funded research lab. And we're right now looking at postdoc research scholar positions. So if you have any question, or if you have any students we're actually seeking opportunity to work in our lab to promote medical science using data. Um, so please reach out. I'll be happy to um, uh, take any questions or inquiries, uh, and I'll be happy to work with email students. So today I'm, I have three students here, and they're presenting some of their research work as well. So these are all the students I've been working with and the faculty members I've been working with over the past few years. Um, references, um, thank you.